Clifton's Pacific Seas Cafeteria, a Los Angeles landmark for almost 30 years, demolished in 1960, and now a parking lot. The Pan Pacific Auditorium, for decades its Art Deco style captivated Los Angeles residents. In 1989 it was seriously damaged by fire, and in 1992 was torn down. It is now a vacant lot. And the famous Brown Derby restaurant, an icon of early Los Angeles, part of it was saved, but now in the 1990s it lives in the midst of a mini mall. Angel's Flight, built in 1901, dismantled in 1969 and now restored in 1996. Yes, Angel's Flight is back. This job is very unique where most jobs, here's a set of drawings and here's a plot of property, land, and you start digging a hole and putting everything together. Well, this is where you had to take everything apart first before you could put everything back together. More than anything else, it's historical. You know, it, uh, it's not like a remodel of a house where you go in and you know you tear things up, throw it back, you, you make it new. Here we actually, uh, to a lot of grief sometimes, had to use the actual old pieces. One of the unique things for us about it is the fact that these are vehicles that will move constantly. This project is really different because it wasn't just seeing a building, it was actually you know riding the flight and looking down upon the city. This is a story about preservation of Los Angeles history. A story about citizens caring about a landmark and enforcing the city's promise to bring it back. And it's a story about professional historic restoration. Architects, engineers, preservationists, construction contractors and subcontractors, and skilled craftspeople who came together to form a unique team. The team that restored Angel's Flight. Angel's flight is, in a way, symbolic of Los Angeles' character through the 20th century. On one hand, an example of the entrepreneurial spirit that built our city and made it what it is today. And on the other hand, in the day of the modern skyscraper, a representation of our desire to remember, honor, and experience our more innocent past. Los Angeles, California, 1890. The city is booming and growing. A hill near downtown becomes a popular site for new homes. It is called Bunker Hill, and it begins to sprout some of the finest mansions in town. In 1895, Colonel James W. Eddy arrives in Los Angeles, and he soon comes up with an idea, an idea that will make his mark on Los Angeles. Eddy figured that the residents in the mansions at the top of Bunker Hill would like to have a quick and reliable way of getting to the markets and businesses at the bottom of the very steep incline. He chose a funicular railway, a cable-based system. But a funicular is no ordinary cable car. It has just two cars, and they're connected to each other with one cable. As one goes up the hill, the other goes down, and they almost counterbalance each other. By today's standards, it was pretty low-tech, but when it opened in 1901, over 2,000 people showed up to ride and marvel at this breakthrough in downtown transportation technology. Eddie called the railway Angel's Flight, and he named the two cars Olivet and Sinai. It was an immediate success. You might say it really took off. Colonel Eddie built the original Angel's Flight at two grades with a gradual ascent from Hill Street to what used to be Clay Street, and then a much steeper grade for the remainder of the trip to Olive Street. This worked well, but on that second grade, the passengers rode at quite an angle. It was like going up that first ramp of a roller coaster, very steep. In 1905, Eddie rebuilt the line with a uniform grade of 33% and rebuilt the cars, slanting the seats at 33% so that his riders could sit upright through the entire trip. The rebuilt Angel's Flight traveled 315 feet at a top speed of three and one half miles per hour. In 1912, Eddie retired, and the flight was sold to the funding company of Los Angeles. And when it changed hands, the state of California got involved, classifying Angel's Flight as a railway, making it the shortest railway in the world. The funding company's ownership lasted less than two years, and in 1914, Angel's Flight was sold to the Continental Securities Company. At this time, Robert Moore became the manager of the flight, and talk about longevity, Moore ran the flight for the next 38 years. 
By 1924, Angel's Flight was transporting over 1,000 people per day, operating day and night, rain or shine, holidays included, all for a nickel fare. By 1945, Angel's Flight was carrying about 6,000 passengers per day. In 1948, Continental Securities decided to get out of the railroad business. Robert Moore, who had grown to love the flight, bought Angel's Flight for himself at the age of 79. Moore kept Angel's Flight going for another four years, and then he met Lester Moreland. Moreland was a regular rider on the flight, and he began a friendship with Moore. Moore wasn't getting any younger, and he could tell that Moreland shared his love for Angel's Flight. So in 1952, he sold it to the Moreland family, who became the last private operators of Angel's Flight. The Morelands, headed by Lester and his wife Helen, and their son Robert, ran the world's shortest railway for the next 10 years. By 1956, it was estimated that over 100 million trips had been taken on Angel's Flight. While the operation of Angel's Flight continued, the neighborhood around the flight was changing. The late 50s brought great decline to the houses and mansions that once graced Bunker Hill, and much of the area degenerated into a dilapidated slum. In 1962, as part of a bigger plan to revitalize the entire Bunker Hill area, Angel's Flight was sold to the city of Los Angeles. In that same year, the city declared Angel's Flight Cultural Historic Landmark Number 4. The city operated Angel's Flight through May of 1969, and by that time, almost every other structure on Bunker Hill had been torn down. Angel's Flight was practically the only structure left standing. Plans for the redevelopment of Bunker Hill included the removal and then the restoration of Angel's Flight. Angel's Flight closed on May 18, 1969, and the city promised that it would return in a few years. When it was dismantled, the cars, archway, and station house were shipped to storage, and then the city and its citizens waited, and waited, and waited. But Angel's Flight couldn't be restored on a hillside going nowhere. The restoration was dependent on the completion of the entire Bunker Hill project. Finally, in the late 1980s, most of the redevelopment on Bunker Hill had been completed, and it was time to get the Angel's Flight project rolling again. Since the original location had been used for a senior's housing project, a new site was chosen. The new site was just a few hundred feet south of the original location of Angel's Flight. Now the restoration could finally begin. On October 31st, 1991, in the middle of the night, moving at almost the same speed as the Angel's Flight cars moved up and down the hillside, the station house and archway came home to Bunker Hill. The move took all night, and at daybreak, everyone could see that the restoration had officially begun. In 1993, the Community Redevelopment Agency retained Harrison Associates as the project and construction managers. Harrison Associates quickly learned how important Angel's Flight was to the community. From an engineering point of view, you, you could just as easily have installed an elevator or a brand new funicular and, and been done with it. But this is an, what I call an emotional project. People it's, uh, wanted to bring this back. It's, a, it's part of the tradition of L.A. It was pretty rough at the beginning. Uh, I believe the historic community has uh, typically been beat up or been rough shot over by, by developers trying to just come in and either bulldoze a project or do whatever they please. And uh, they were a little distrustful of us at the beginning. And over time, and just you know, constant cajoling and working with them, I think we finally gained their trust. Everybody in preservation adopts something, a building, a structure, a park, something that means something to them. I was really impressed by the way that the community took to this project and really kept track of it. We're, we're really interested in the details of it. It. it was taken away with a promise to return, and I think that that's a very important element here, that when it was dismantled in 1969, the city said it would be returned within two years. We know it took 27 years to get it back, but it, it, th that commitment was there, and it really kept people, people wanted to uphold that commitment. I mean, they'd been told Angel's Fight was coming back, and they wanted it back. 
And you know, through this through this time period, you know, we every month we got you know phone calls. When is Angel's flight coming back? You know, what's the latest? And so I mean, it never really went away. And and and, and I think that that's a really powerful statement of how how strongly people feel about Angel's flight. The next two years were spent on the design and planning process. As part of this process, the Redevelopment Agency and Harris began assembling the group of individuals and companies that would become the Angels Flight Team. The team then set about the task of conducting the historic research and preparing the restoration plans. The station house and the arch had been sitting out outdoors in storage for 25 years and were very decrepit. Uh, we had absolutely no knowledge of how they had originally been constructed other than just what you could view from the outside. So a major part of our early work was doing a historic structures report which involved actually going up and x-raying uh, and examining the, how the buildings were constructed. You want to put things back absolutely correctly, particularly with something as important as Angel's Flight. That's a very tedious project. You start with good solid documentation, whether that be drawings or photographs. Before any work could begin, many decisions had to be made. Among them, what year should Angel's Flight be restored to? Should it be as it was when it was first built? Or should it be made to look like it did in 1969 when it was dismantled? We really relied on the historic community to give us direction as to what year to bring it back to. There was a lot of, lot of discussion about the decision on whether to go with the black and white color scheme or the orange and black color scheme because those are the really two time periods that, that were looked at and, and kind of the guiding influence for the conservancy and for really most of the preservation field in decision making is the Secretary of Interior standards which are, were developed by the National Park Service and these standards basically say that you have to be true to one period. And in particular this project the direction was to restore the facility to what it was in 1969 when it was taken down uh, so that when we put it back it will be just as people remembered it. Well I think early on the, the big, big challenge on the project uh, was that the uh, City Council had requested that we try to accommodate the handicap if at all possible. The historic uh, code allows an exemption for rail cars that are more than 25 years old and Angel's Flight is, is many more years than 25 years old and while well, technically we were allowed the exemption we still felt we needed to provide this wheelchair access and uh, we hope they enjoy it. On March 9th, 1995, with the plans drawn up and documentation well underway, a groundbreaking ceremony was held at the new Angel's Flight site. Following the groundbreaking, the next step in the restoration was the careful dismantling and inspection of the major elements of the flight, the station house, the archway, and the two cars, Olivet and Sinai. When we first arrived at the, at the job site and saw all of the old structures up on cribbing, all dilapidated and everything, I think our initial impression was, my God, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Because it looked in such state of disrepair that we were very puzzled for a long time until you get over the initial shock of looking at what you're going to work on. So when we saw the archway and we saw the station house, we knew that we could take it apart. We knew that that would be something that we could do, that we could clean it up individually because we've always taken things apart and putting it back together. So we weren't afraid. We thought the station house and the arch might come apart in 30 pieces. They came apart in about 500 pieces. You have to be very careful as you dismantle something like this. You have to be extra careful and, and take more notes than you think and then do it again. You know, it's like the old thing of measure twice and cut once it really applies. The station house would be disassembled piece by piece and all the pieces taken to Pueblo Contracting's San Fernando workshop. The archway, however, presented additional problems. We were originally planning on using the, the arch columns. Uh, as much of the historic fabric of this, the arch as, as much as possible. But in the process of uh, trying to reconstruct it, it was discovered that the steel columns within the, within the columns had rusted, so it was starting to deteriorate from the inside out. Meanwhile, in a warehouse on the edge of downtown, the Angel's Flight cars also presented a challenge to the restoration team. We began to explore the extent of damage on the cars uh, and 
the actual things that were going to be necessary to do the restoration of the cars and bring them back to a usable condition again. This type of deterioration is caused by water standing on a wood member constantly. You see here that the main chassis member has rotted out uh, and also has rotted out the, the vertical member which holds up the roof. We have to inspect every joint to make sure that it's a solid connection that is very stable uh, because of the fact that we are very concerned about the safety of the cars. While the cars were being dismantled piece by piece, construction at the new home of Angel's Flight was well underway. In order to achieve the same angle of operation as the original flight, a podium extension was built onto the edge of California Plaza. This podium would become the platform for the station house, as well as provide the necessary space for the new drive and cable system. On May 25th, the podium was ready for the rebuilding of the station house to begin. After close inspection, the team found that the original columns on the station house were structurally sound and they could be reused to form the frame of the restored structure. One by one, with great care, the columns were hoisted up to the podium and secured to the slab. While the columns were being installed, back in San Fernando, the team was busy restoring the wooden elements of the station house. Cosmetically, the wood looks like it's in pretty bad shape, but there's um, just a lot of years in it, and it's not really as bad as it, as it looks. A lot of it's very workable still. We have a set of blueprints of our own, and then I take my own and make my own drawings and a lot of my own notes and sketches as well, just to make sure those numbers, everything jives with everything else, so that when I go to put it back together, I've triple checked it. It's just a matter of being very careful. You can't just nail a couple of two by fours back together. It's not that kind of a job. We have retained as much of what we call historic fabric, the original wood, the cast concrete pieces, uh, steel bars, you name it. It's our objective in terms of integrity to keep the original pieces and put them back in the building and only replace pieces that, that were missing or so deteriorated that we couldn't repair them. I can very confidently say that better than 90% of the station house and the cars and all the parts of the construction are original material. Olivet and Sinai had now been taken apart, and the structural engineers devised a plan to ensure the safety and structural integrity of the cars without compromising the historic fabric. When we looked at the, at the poor condition of the undercarriage, all of the wood framing was rotted, dilapidated, fastened poorly, but we were able to figure out a way to install a new steel chassis inside the old historic fabric and leaving all of the old wood in place but not relying on it to actually do any structure anymore. Similarly, the original track support structure could not be utilized. Modern building codes require a much stronger foundation than was used in 1901. On August 7th, the first portion of the new track support system was created. New foundations are drilled and poured. When the foundation is completed, the track supports will be installed at ground level. Down the hillside, the archway project was in progress. The original columns of the 1909 archway had become so unstable that their reuse was deemed unsafe. New columns were made, but the team made exact replicas of the original columns by creating a fiberglass mold from those columns and pouring concrete into the molds. When the molds are stripped away, the new column is left in place. Now the original precast concrete portions of the arch can be added to these columns, thus recreating the Angel's Flight arch. Although the restoration of the components of Angel's Flight is carried out separately, the archway, track system, station house, and cars all must work together when the project is completed. To make sure that the work is progressing on schedule and that the work on one component doesn't adversely affect another component, Team members meet weekly during the construction phase to discuss all aspects of the project. It took a group that was really in tune to using historic structures and rebuilding historic structures to do this project. Uh, to end up with a finished product that it is the exact historic product as opposed to something that um, looks just like it but it was all new. Uh, cleaned, clear coated and reinstalled back on the cars. They're the Olivet sign, the Sinai sign and the uh, do not enter when the red light is on. Mm -hmm.
Construction projects take a very large team. Uh, people really pitch in and that's what it takes. There are a lot of challenges in every project because we have to put buildings back together to stand up in earthquakes and meet a lot of current codes to be safe. In a project like Angel's Flight, there are even more challenges than usual because we're building a railroad. This is a transportation project, not just a building. And it took a lot of hands uh, working, pushing and pulling to make it work again and still be authentic. The 37.5 um, volt system was oriented towards the 36 volt railway lamps bulbs in there, which occasionally people would steal, but then they'd realize they couldn't use them for anything. So one of Mr. Moreland's theories was they didn't get stolen too often because they were this odd voltage. Is that the same case with 24? The answer to your question, John, is 24 volts is more common and it's easier to work with. The people are all working in the same, sort of toward, toward the same goal, even though we may not agree always on what the most sensitive historic solution is that we're always able to explore alternatives and re reach a consensus among the very disciplines. On October 11th, the installation of the track support members began. These supports vary in height, depending upon where on the hillside they are to be placed. Formed of concrete and designed to resemble the original structure, they will span the distance up the hillside. Placed on top of the supports is a prefabricated cross member upon which the tracks will be attached. At the end of the day, Angel's Flight begins to look like a railroad. Soon, the Angel's Flight cars were reassembled and received a coat of primer paint. The station house was being reassembled, piece by piece, on site. Most of the wooden pieces had been rejuvenated and restored. In some cases, however, where pieces were missing, new elements were created. And here, too, special attention is paid to historic accuracy. The issue of authenticity um, the word we keep coming back to is to say that even if things aren't pretty in the traditional architectural sense or built according to the strongest standards, we wanted to put back all the interesting and funny little pieces of Angel's Flight the way they were in 1969 so that it would be a representative of that, that cultural institution that people know and remember. Examples of that are the letters on top of the cars which we went to great pains to reproduce from photographs uh, to be as awkwardly unprofessional as they originally were made. But we take great pleasure in, in knowing that even though we were surprised at how clumsy they were, that we put them back just the way they were. In January of 1996, the track is installed, followed by the drive system and controls. The new control system is fully computerized. The operator's console includes a visual display of the relative position of the cars, their speed, the distance traveled, and other important operating parameters. We want to give the people of Los Angeles and our visitors the same experience as they were getting in 1945, in 1955, and in 1965. And therefore, we have gone at great lengths not to be too modern in some cases. And so, for example, the flight was operated for 68 years by an operator in the station house bringing up the cars, closing the turnstiles at the bottom, collecting the fares. And today, in the 1990s and in the 21st century, Angel Flight is operated by an operator in the station house, operating the cars, closing the gates, and collecting the fares. And he may, in fact, have a much more modern system that he pushes a button to have a computer control, but still it is the same outward feeling for, the, for our visitors. It's now January 30th, 1996. A historic day, though by the looks of things at 6 a.m. it appears to be a typical day dawning in downtown L.A. The Angel's Flight cars, Olivet and Sinai, are completely restored with a new steel undercarriage and the outside made mostly of original parts. They support a fresh coat of paint and the original flooring and seats are shined and varnished. And this morning, Olivet and Sinai will come home, home to Bunker Hill home to Angel's Flight. Traveling through the streets of LA, the cars pass through a downtown that has changed dramatically. It, in some ways, is the same as it was when the cars left the central city in 1969. They arrive at daybreak at the base of Angel's Flight. One car will be lifted onto the track at the bottom of the hill, on Hill Street, and the other car will be hoisted to the top of the hill at California Plaza. 
taking almost the entire day and with extreme care and caution, the two cars that symbolize the city's beloved funicular are carefully placed onto the track. First all of it, and there the wheels are on the track. Then the cable is attached by the engineers. Later in the afternoon, Sinai goes up and sets down gently on its track. With the connection of Sinai's cable, the funicular railway is ready to roll for the first time in over 26 years. We're getting ready right now to test, uh, test run the, the cars up and down the track, and once these cars pass each other, I'll, I'll be celebrating. Now comes a moment that the team has waited for. Engineers stand by the controls in the station house, and power is applied. The cars inch along the track. So far, so good. Power is applied again, and everything seems to be working. Soon, the moment of truth. Olivet and Sinai approach each other at the middle of the track. And they pass, with a clearance at the roof line of five-eighths of an inch. Testing of the system continues for the next three weeks, and each detail of the original Angel's flight experience is checked and double-checked. We were quite concerned about the uh, squeakiness and ricketiness of the old cars being lost in this all, all this modern structural retrofitting. This issue came up quite extensively during the uh, development of the scheme to strengthen the cars, and I think we've been able to achieve a feel that still feels like the old folks that remember riding on it are still going to feel like it is Angel's Flight and not some modern amusement ride. By February of 1996, Angel's Flight is almost complete. After applying a few finishing touches, the time comes for Angel's Flight to be officially rededicated. On February 23rd, city officials, restoration team members, and the public gather at the historic Hill Street Arch. Much like the original dedication in 19. 1901, speeches are made by the mayor and other officials. With great fanfare, the inaugural run of Angel's Flight begins. And the mayor's reaction? That's right, thumbs up. Saturday, February 24th, a beautiful, sunny Southern California day. Hill Street is closed, and a street festival is underway. A festival that gives the public the opportunity to welcome Angel's Flight back to Los Angeles. Thousands of Angelinos are on hand, some who remember Angel's Flight, and some too young to remember. With the conclusion of speeches, the flight is open to the public. Lines stretch as far as you can see, both at the Hill Street Arch and the Station House above at California Plaza. And riders continue to line up into the late afternoon. And as dusk falls on California Plaza, Angel's Flight retakes its place. As a vital part of Los Angeles' past, its present and its future. This is exactly to me what having a baby is like. There's, you know, moments of great pain, if you might say, and then you're, you're thinking, am I ever going to get through this thing? And then other pieces of times it'd just be breezing together. For a year and a half, it was, you know, start, stop, start, stop. But I loved it. It's a wonderful, wonderful preservation project, and I think that one reason that it is such an amazing project is that it's fun. And I think we sort of forget that in life, that it's important to, to, to have fun and that sense of joy. And, and so, you know, one of my great moments is, is, you know, being able to ride up and down Angel's Flight and just experience with everybody else how much fun it is, that sort of that, to, to actually feel and touch history. And the little flight is just as practical today as it was in 1925 or 1965, because it's a steep hill and people want to go from the top to the bottom. People have senses of humor, people have senses of wonder, and Angel's Flight addresses wonder, practicality, and humor. This one project could probably do more to bring back the image, the positive image of the city of Los Angeles. People thought they'd never see it again. It is back. Uh, I think if you want to relate it to something it would be like San Francisco's cable cars or an emblem to that city, I think Angel's Flight will do the same thing for downtown Los Angeles. This might sound uh, funny, but it sometimes it's almost like the people that originally put Angel's Flight together were, lo were looking down on us sometimes because it went so smoothly. It'll last for another hundred years, and I'm glad to have it back.